Well, good morning and welcome to another Reopen Connecticut Arts Venues Science-Based Safety. I'm Eric Dillner, the CEO of the Shoreline Arts Alliance and the chair of this task force. Uh, I, I'm so thrilled that we have so many new folks today. It's amazing to me each time we, we, uh, we look at our lists of folks, it's amazing each, each week uh, or each month or whenever we do them uh, to see the growth of this group. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, the mission of our task force is to offer you the opportunity to reopen your arts venue from a public health perspective. Remain open with the professional guidance in the workplace and in your artistic spaces. Provide a listening and sharing platform and help build consumer confidence through science. Our goal is to offer clarity, practical scientific advice, and an opportunity to ask questions related to your own risk reduction strategies. We've left a lot of time for that today, so please start uh, shooting your questions into our Q&A. Uh, together, we're going to reopen Connecticut Arts venues and many other venues across the country with prudence and knowledge. Uh, today, uh, we marks a, another spectacular webinar with over 14,000 viewers in over 18 states and three countries. We're so thankful to um, all of you who've become members uh, of the Shoreline Arts Alliance to help uh, provide support for this, and those of you who, uh, who sign in and, and support it in so many ways. We're also really deeply thankful for the Emily Hall Tremaine Foundation, Connecticut Office of the Arts, Connecticut Community Foundation, Community Foundation of Greater New Haven, Connecticut Humanities, and the Community Foundation of Middlesex County for stepping up as major partners in this as we advocate together. And of course, we can't thank enough the wonderful support of Yale School of Public, Public Health led by the wonderful Sten Vermoon. Uh, what a tremendous gift you've all given us uh, in the arts community. Um, it just, again, we, we can't thank you all enough. We encourage everyone to attend each and every one of our webinars and follow the Shoreline Arts Alliance's YouTube channel and Facebook channel for additional information. Just wanna, uh, wanna once again remind everybody to, um, to, to look at www.shorelinearts uh, to find as much as you, information as you need. Also, um, our website is now fully accessible and today, if you, if, you're, if you would like, you can turn on or off your uh, closed captioning button. Uh, we, of course, want you to feel free to share the information broadly with your colleagues. I'm so pleased once again to introduce my colleague, Sten Fairmoon. Sten is the Dean of Yale School of Public Health, and he holds the NMR Louder Chair in Public Health, as well as a secondary appointment in the Pediatrics in the Yale School of Medicine. We're so honored to have him offer such important advice and lead our partners nationwide to great success. We also have with us today our dedicated engineer to the arts, Crystal Paulet. Crystal is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Health Services, uh, Sciences of the Yale School of Public Health, and she also holds an appointment in School of Engineering and Applied Science. Crystal, last night I attended your webinar, uh, Clearing the Air. You were fantastic. It was great to uh, see you celebrate all the work you're doing with the arts as well. Uh, it was really, uh, we were honored to be, uh, to be a part of your platform last night. So thank you, uh, thank you both so much for caring so deeply about the arts community and for continuing to make, uh, help us make uh, our difficult decisions as we go, go along. Today, uh, we just wanna uh, make sure that you understand why we're here today. You all have requested uh, so much more help. Last webinar, we just couldn't answer all the questions that were coming in. So uh, we are thrilled that you, you sent them along. And then we also received a ton of questions in the last week or so. So after calling all of those requests, we found several uh, common threads needing a deeper dive. So today we're gonna begin that process, process of doing a deeper dive. And then a little, little bit later in the program, we'll share our next steps for the coming months. Um, and also I want you to all to be prepared. We're gonna have you an answer, answer a quick survey um, either today uh, at the end of the webinar or um, in the next few days uh, to help us with the pathway to gain success to support you even more. Uh, again, due to the overwhelming number of questions, I really encourage you to, um, to send in your questions, get your questions going in now. Please use the chat for sharing resources. So um, Crystal, I know I'm gonna be sharing some things through that, uh, but um, let's use the Q&A for all the questions so we're not bopping back and forth. Um, one of the big questions over the last few weeks has been, uh, how do I please my guests? What, what do I do? Um, and, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. What are the comfort zones? Uh, what should I do? What should we do? Uh, what decision making should our staffs, artists, teachers, visitors, and patrons alike um, be encouraged to make on their own? And what should we be, we be making for them? Uh, most importantly, our customers 
are, are need to be satisfied. So we're all working together to figure that out. Um, and we, of course, want them to go out and spread the word in the community uh, what's what's happening at your venue in such a great way. So let's let's make sure we, we paint the picture uh, well. Stan, let's start with you with a, with an update. Uh, what have you seen from the medical perspective since our regulations have been dropped so drastically? Um, do we have any substantial data that uh, the risk has been mitigated by the vaccine? Uh, where are we? Stan? Thank you, Eric. Um, a, a year ago, we had 400 people who were hospitalized in the Yale New Haven Health System hospitals. There are five hospitals in that system. And today there are 18. Uh, or wait, uh, 28, sorry, 28. So it's um, a radical departure from what we were up against as recently as four or five months ago, and especially uh, about uh, 15 months ago. So at the end of the day, uh, we're pleased uh, that the um, coronavirus transmission has plummeted and severe disease is now uncommon. Um, the origin of this is probably two, two, well, threefold, let's say. Number one, half the number of people in our state are susceptible because half of us are vaccinated. So when you reduce the population of susceptible people, you would expect a diminution in the number of new cases. The second reason is um, fidelity to prevention strategies. Um, so continued masking, continued physical distancing, continued hand hygiene, pivoting to outdoor activities. And the third is just the weather. Uh, these respiratory viruses tend to do better in cooler, drier indoor air than they do in moister, warmer air with a lot of outside air mixed in. Uh, so those are probably the three reasons why uh, this has plummeted. As you recall, rates declined very substantially last spring as well, such that rates in the summer last summer were low. So I think one of the big questions is when we reconvene in the autumn, when our schools are back in session, when we've returned our society to quasi-normal status, um, will, be, will we be prepared for an upsurge in coronavirus transmission when the new respiratory viral season commences in late uh, November? A rule of thumb is usually around Thanksgiving, you start up with what, what is often called flu season, but more accurately should be called respiratory virus season. And um, what our goal is, um, is, nonetheless, in, is nothing less than herd immunity. We would like to have 80% of all people in our state and our region to be vaccinated by uh, the start of respiratory virus season so that rather than having a surge of coronavirus in unvaccinated people, we would blunt the, the, the surge and the, the, the likelihood of transmission would be so low because more than 80% of people would be immune that we won't see that surge. So I think we're in very good shape now. It's, uh, it's wonderful news that uh, Connecticut is a top three state in the country in terms of uh, uh, vaccine coverage. Uh, we're not there yet, though. We we are we are well shy of 80 percent coverage. Obviously, we are not vaccinating our children under the age of 12 yet. Um, but our goal in the summer should be get all the all of our teenagers vaccinated, um, get all of our reluctant adults vaccinated who can be coaxed to agree to vaccination, and then we would expect by the end of the summer, perhaps uh, by September, that the children's clinical trials will be completed and we'll know what the dosing will be for kids. And we're hoping that October, November, December can be a very intense period to vaccinate the children so that we really achieve that uh, 
80 percent, 85, 90 percent coverage of vaccination. Keep in mind that vaccination is probably better than all the other uh, mitigation strategies that we've been discussing all year put together. Yeah, I mean, you when you have a vaccine that's 95 percent effective at preventing symptomatic disease, 99 percent effective at preventing hospitalization, and the, it's it's so good at preventing death that it's hard to calculate, but it's probably better than 99.99 percent effective. Now that does mean that a vaccin vaccine vaccinee may die of COVID, but it will be their likelihood of dying of COVID is probably one in a hundred thousand less, you know, uh, than 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 if you're not vaccinated. So the overwhelm, a hundred percent of the 15 patients who are currently in the Yale New Haven Hospital were not vaccinated, 100% of them. And I'm going to expect that these sorts of statistics become routine. It'll be, now, the reason I tell you this is because journalists like stories. And if a vaccinated person gets seriously ill from COVID or dies of COVID, that's a story. But you have to think like an epidemiologist. Don't think like a reader of a, an exciting story. I want you to think like epidemiologists, each and every one of you. You have to realize that the, that, that the overwhelming number of people dying of COVID are going to be the unvaccinated. So this is a wonderful tool and it's a tool that uh, provides tremendous promise for revitalizing our arts and our museums and our events because if we can vaccinate our staff, our performers, our docents, uh, we can protect our own community. And then if we can um, have strategies to maximize the uh, vaccinated uh, pool of our clients, that will also build a lot of confidence in the folks who come. I myself am vaccinated, I've been vaccinated for a while now, and I have no concerns at all uh, going into a museum or going to an event. I don't mind sitting next to a non-vaccinated person, won't bother me a bit. My likelihood of getting COVID as a vaccinated person is so low that I put this in the same category of other risks that I take in my workday, like going to work or driving down a, a busy road or whatever. So I take risks every day, all of us do. And now that I'm vaccinated, being exposed to COVID is a very low risk for me and I, I'm not worried about it. However, your 72-year-old uh, season ticket holder of, of your events uh, may not feel the way that I do. And they may, they may be vaccinated. Oops, I'm, I'm losing You're back. something. I'm back, okay. Yeah. Uh, they may be vaccinated, uh, but they may not feel comfortable sitting next to a stranger who may not be masked. So there may be some provisions similar to when I went into a store the other day and it said very clearly, even if I, I, I went to one store, it said, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. But I went into another store that said. It looks like we're having a little challenge with STEM. Uh, right in the arts uh, community. Oh, there he is. Oh, you lost me again. Well, we you're have back. To decide. You're back for Okay, we have to decide in the arts community, what's gonna be our policy? Are we going to reassure the minority of people that, that every safety precaution has been taken, therefore you have to mask and we're gonna physically distance in the, in the auditorium? Or are we going to say, look, the likelihood is so low of an exposure that we're going to return to normal and, uh, and uh, we're going, so these are the sorts of discussions I presume that you'll be having with your boards and your uh, managing directors, and I'm happy to advise, you know, uh, as another opinion. Well, we, we thank you again, Sten, so much for this. It's helping so many of us uh, through this. And, and thanks for the great news. Uh, we, were, we were hoping we would, we would learn that about uh, the vaccines and all that's going on. And, and we need to get everybody to the confidence level that you're, that you're at, that's, that's wonderful. So unfortunately though, we know uh, that a lot, that not 100% of our clientele are vaccinated. And so um, a lot of questions uh, continue to, to be asked uh, of, of us and by arts leaders, uh, uh, you know, as to what to do. And, and I think uh, we have Becky from the director of the Florence Griswold Museum on the line. 
to, uh, to ask uh, a couple of questions that have come in. Thanks, Eric. And hi, Staten. Good to see you. Um, the first question I have is about contract uh, contact tracing. This was something that many of us have enacted um, to gather data. Is contact tracing still practical, recommended, necessary? What are your thoughts on that? One of the simplest things that one can do is simply have a little, little piece of paper with the individual's name and their contact phone number. You put that into um, uh, a, a bucket um, and, and you, you could have a little, you could have a little array and you just say the museum is open uh, at uh, nine o'clock today and from nine to 11, these people came in and then from uh, 11 to one, these people came in and you just have it. And if in the unlikely event that a um, um, district or state health officer were to contact you and say, Mr. Smith came to uh, Flow Grizz on, uh, on, on Saturday. Well, you will, without any difficulty at all, track down Mr. Uh, Mr. Smith and you'll be able to know all the people in the time zone, the time before and the time after, and you can give that to the contact tracers. And that's all I would do if I were the director of Flow Grizz, which is my dream job, by the way. <laughs> so let me know if you're gonna retire. Um, <laughs> because I'm utterly unqualified, but it's still my dream job. <laughs> the point is that um, I think you um, can do something very simple. Uh, restaurants in Massachusetts have been doing this uh, for the for the entire uh, COVID time. And it's not it's not your job to do contact tracing. You are not the state health De uh, department of public health. And uh, you, you, you don't have the resources, you don't have the personnel, you don't have the responsibility. But if you were to assist the contact tracers with a very simple system like this, they would be incredibly grateful because you will have just massively improved their ability to notify contacts and have those people go for testing. Now you will probably collect thousands of these little pieces of paper and never use them because the number of cases emerging in Connecticut is now about two per hundred thousand per day. So it's very low and our, our test positivity rate is very low. So it's, it's likely that you'll never get that call from the Department of Public Health. And I don't think it would be irrational if a particular venue simply said, well, we won't do this until the State Department of Public Health asks us to. But we could talk with Liz Shapiro. We could talk with um, the state epidemiologist in um, uh, Matt Carter, and we could have this discussion with them to see if the state wants to give some guidance to the arts organizations around doing something like this. Because I just would hate for you to waste your time and effort doing something that wasn't going to be useful. Um, I'm sort of giving you my sense of what Matt Carter might be interested in your doing such that you could empower his team should there be an outbreak. Uh, but, um, but we might want to do some consultation with the state on that issue. That's, that's really helpful, Sten. Thank you. Um, and following up on that, should we be asking visitors and audience members to sign a waiver of any kind to release liability? if they contract COVID at our venue, um, how should we handle that moving forward? Yeah, yeah, Eric and the team are always trying to trick me into answering legal questions. <laughs> and I, they, they haven't caught me yet. You know, I, I'm too smart for you guys. Uh, uh -huh. I don't actually know what the legalities of something like that would be. However, uh, there are many constraints on visiting a public uh, venue, even if you're a private or a nonprofit organization. You can constrain people. If someone is not dressed properly, you can pr block their access. If they are, are visibly, visibly intoxicated, you can block their access. 
So I believe that an attorney might tell you that you have some rights in, uh, in determining who can and can visit your uh, venue where vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, comportment. You know, you can exclude somebody who's shouting at you. You can exclude somebody who's dressed inappropriately or vis-a-vis uh, -vis safety, so, which is where the intoxicated person comes in, which is where the uh, non-vaccinated person comes in. So there are, it's a big continuum. You can um, restrict access to your concert or your museum to vaccinated people. You can... Um, uh, do what the uh, professional sports leagues are doing, the NBA. You can um, have the vaccinated people sit in the front and the unvaccinated people sit with masks and physical distancing in the back. You can um, simply permit everybody to come in, but ask everyone to um, take precautions. Or you can, you can do what that store did when I went shopping yesterday or day before, uh, which is they said that if you are vaccinated, you don't have to take precautions, but if you're va unvaccinated, you do have to take precautions. Now I'm evading your question about whether or not uh, there should be a, a waiver signed. And um, I don't know the answer to your question. So Becky, we will talk about that a little bit later in the session as well. So thank you, Sten, for your, your take on that. That's, uh, that's why we, we're, we're going to follow up later with, a, with another a little another twist to that. But thank you so much. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see, Crystal, let's, uh, let's move over to Crystal for a little bit. Welcome again. Uh, and again, thanks for sharing all your good information last night. That was fascinating. Uh, many folks sent in questions about the CO2 monitors and really feel like they need a little, just a little bit more uh, information on venting and airflow. And, and if they have the CO2 monitor, really, how do they use it? So we just want to take a little, little, little pause right here and turn it over to you to, to really walk us through like this CO2 monitor that we, some of us have tried, but some of us need a little more guidance. Do you mind doing that for us, Crystal? And welcome. Oh, we can't hear you. Yet. There you oh, go. Can you hear me now? Great. Yeah. Great. There you go. So I, I really love the CO2 monitors because it is a small little sensor. It costs about $100, $200 um, dollars that you can just mount on your wall. Uh, and it's going to give you uh, some indication on the level of ventilation in your space relative to the number of people um, that, that you have present. So you can buy these um, off of Amazon. There's a number of different companies. Um, that are selling them. So they're really quite easily obtainable. You can place them right by your thermostats and preferably away from some open doors or windows because that's going to overestimate the amount of ventilation um, that you have present. And I've created a, a little schematic in terms of um, the range of levels that you can expect to see there. So this is an example of, of one CO2 uh, sensor that um, I really like in terms of its accuracy uh, levels um, and then paired with uh, different levels that you're going to see being measured. So outside, uh, we have levels of about 400 parts per billion or ppm uh, that we'll see. So those are really the lowest levels that you would ever have to see if you have an incredibly well ventilated space. As you have people within your space, you're going to have some amount of ventilation. We expect the levels um, to be about between 400 and 1,000 ppm. As soon as you start getting to 1,000 ppm, that's the maximum recommended level for, for indoor spaces. Once you hit the uh, 1,200 ppm threshold, that's really when you're going to want to be proactive about having more ventilation capabilities present. If you ever see numbers approaching 2,000, that's when you know you have very poor air quality. You want to start exiting, vacating that space, or having more ventilation being brought in immediately. And I'd be more than happy to share this slide so it can be posted um, and placed even immediately besides one of the sensors if you're able to place them in your unit. Um, and also just share one other example of a photo that, that I saw can't come up and was um, being used in a, a concert venue in, in Tokyo. Uh, where they had uh, a very large display 
of CO2 levels within their, um, their space. Uh, and then color coded to say that we have levels that are below 1000 ppm, these levels are good to reassure the audience um, and the patrons that there was indeed good ventilation and low risk of, of transmission for COVID, but also um, even as we approach other, um, we were respiratory virus season um, later in the year um, to give an indication of safety. Well, that's good consumer confidence right there. Right, right before your very eyes, it's great. Good, thank you, Crystal. Wonderful. Um, Judy Dorn of the Judy Dorn Performance Project, you have a, a couple of follow-up questions. Yes, thanks. Um, wondering about CO2 monitoring for a very large space. Would this work in even a space of 10,000 um, feet or more? Yeah, it, it definitely has applicability. I would recommend having multiple units because even with a very large space, there's going to be some different types of ventilation as you get into the nooks and crannies of spaces that aren't necessarily having the same amount of airflow. So being aware of spaces that have less ventilation accessible, maybe underneath some, some balconies, um, and especially in some corner units behind stages, um, curtains, make sure that you're placing it in appropriate levels uh, or different spaces that you can you can capture those variances. And what about um, proper ventilation, ascertaining what is proper ventilation for a performance space or a rehearsal space? CO2 monitor again, work? A CO2 monitor is gonna give you a very good proxy for what the amount of ventilation that is present. In, in past discussions, we've talked about um, looking at the number of air changes within a space that an HVAC um, system is providing for the building. Um, and I will definitely share additional resources on um, looking at um, a flow through diagram that you can see specific spaces and different ventilation options that can be implemented. And um, would time in the space or the kind of activity in the space also come into play? Yes, so the risk of, of being infected, be it with, with COVID or with any other respiratory disease is, um, is a factor of how much the concentration is, what the levels are. So how much say people are talking, projecting, um, releasing with, with wind instruments uh, and, and also the time spent in the space. So we're thinking about both those two um, parameters coupled together. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Crystal. Um, and, um, and Becky, I think you have a question that'll, that'll kind of take us along the same similar path here that can talk about capacity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks, Eric. Sten, we were so fortunate to have you and Eric help us last year during the pandemic as we reopened and we're trying to keep people safe in every way we could. One area that we talked about that I know is still of concern is capacity determining the number of guests in specific rooms and buildings. Today, not knowing if guests are vaccinated, how do small historic museums and galleries figure out building capacity? With very low community transmission levels, um, I think that returning to near normal is perfectly reasonable. I don't think that our Connecticut museums and uh, uh, other small venues are, are overwhelmed with individuals, um, uh, except if there's a school group or a bus tour or something. Um, and pacing individuals through uh, the venue would strike me to be um, a good thing to do still. But uh, I think one can radically increase the, um, the capacity. Um, and it will depend upon what your provision is for uh, vaccine status. So I just answered one of the Q and A's. Um, let me see if I can go back to my answer because it seems relevant now. So um, the question was, do you require proof of vaccination to admit people into your concert or your museum? And I think that would be very tough for us to manage. Uh, what are you gonna do? Have a volunteer at, you know, check people's vaccine status at the door? What if they forgot to bring their card? 
Are you going to ask them to scan it and email it to you? I mean, you know, let's get real. Um, however, you could make it clear on your website, on your box office, something like, please defer to returning to your venue here until which time you have been fully COVID vaccinated. So what you're doing is you're 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 asking the clientele to self-segregate to not purchase the ticket if they're not vaccinated that would be a non there'd be no way you could um you could monitor that and you might have people who buy it even though they're not vaccinated but many people who are not vaccinated who see that may say oh well i'm not welcome at this venue and therefore i'll wait till i'm vaccinated to to come back and if they are hardcore sort of anti-vaxxers, they may not be coming to your concert or your venue anyway. So you may not be you may not be um, alienating as many people as you might think. So I, I'm just I'm just trying to put myself in your shoes and what I might do if I were running things, and I might have that sort of volunteerism um, uh, as 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 a component. If you accept non-vaccinated people to come to your concerts or venues, you're going to make a lot of people very insecure. You're going to make a lot of your folks who are vaccinated but are still nervous, uh, particularly some of your older uh, patrons, very nervous. So are you going to lose more clients by asking people to be vaccinated? Or are you going to lose more clients by not requiring vaccination, letting people in, that's uh, that's a balance balancing act for you to for you to figure out. But I do think that reduces your legal liability. For example, if you are saying purchase of this ticket uh, it, uh, um, confirms that you have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, then if they purchase it anyway, that legal liability would fall on them. Maybe if if I were an attorney, but I'm guessing. Okay, great. Thank you, Stan. Thank you so much for that. Judy, um, Dorn, do you have a follow-up the, in the performance world? So, yeah, Stan, how might this apply to a performance venue? Um, same kind of idea. Um, how does a performance venue think about capacity at this point? And also how you see people? What is the distance between people in that way? You know, um, I was very skittish about how we were going to be able to manage this until I found out what the NBA is doing. And they're they're saying you've got to be vaccinated um, to sit with other people, and if you're not going to be vaccinated for whatever reason, you know you have a medical contraindication or religious contraindication, whatever it is, um, then you are um, going to sit in the back, physically distanced and masked. Now I don't know if you want to adopt something like that, but it's interesting that a large for-profit entertainment industry, professional sports, is adopting something along those lines. Um, and um, it might very well be something that is more manageable than one thinks. Because if, if I'm sitting next to somebody um, and I'm not masked and I'm not physically distanced, I may want to be reassured that they are vaccinated. So that could be an option and um and then voluntarily asking people now if somebody lies and they're not vaccinated and they sprinkle themselves in with the vaccinated people then likelihood of uh damage is minimal because who who are they going to get the exp uh, the virus from if everybody sitting around them is vaccinated so it may not matter that much if somebody lies but those are the sorts of considerations I would urge on all of you. And uh, again, we may be able to have these conversations at the state level to see if our arts um, advisors at the state level and our Department of Public Health people could get together on this, give us all guidance. Mm -hmm. Thank That's you. great. Good, thank you both. Um, well, Krista, let's turn back to you. Um, we have uh, enjoyed the success of, of your uh, your creation of this idea of um, keeping us, keeping the air filtered in, in many of our spaces, the little room I'm in here, 
uh, you know, not, not great ventilation unless I just start opening all the windows and then I'm outdoors. So that's good. But sometimes there's spaces that we really need to think about, um, uh, you know, filtering the air. Uh, and every time Sten and I are out in a, on a site visit and you're there, we, we always end up coming back to the DIY solution because so many few folks are concerned about the amount of dollars it costs to do this. Um, your simple solution is, is great. We had a lot of folks actually ask once again for us to sh send them out uh, how to do this. Maybe, maybe you could just remind us how that works and share, share a little bit about that, that process again. So what, three really easy, low cost ways to, to increase ventilation in a space. So the first is opening windows, uh, no cost. Uh, and it works really well. Um, I've shown in past cases the amount of decrease within um, particle levels if the windows open or close. Second one is just take a box fan and make sure that it is exhausting out. It moves about a thousand cubic feet per minute. So that's an incredibly large volume of air for something that you can buy pre COVID times about $20 now, about $50, um, but still really inexpensive. And then the, the third is these um, portable air cleaners. Uh, so commercially available devices, readily available, make sure they don't generate ozone, make sure they don't have any ionizers, uh, that they are simply just pulling air through a filter. Uh, and those can run you anywhere from 150, maybe $500, depending on the size of the unit. The alternative to that is building your own device. Now, Nothing complicated. This just involves taking the same box fan, twenty to fifty dollars from your local hardware store, Amazon, and then attaching a furnace filter onto the front of it. Simply using uh, duct tape works well. So just making sure you don't have any gaps, you no know, air can flow in between little uh, cracks um, or spaces, and that will provide um, again a very good um, source of ventilation. So I've sent all of these. Um, these slides to, uh, to Eric uh, to post on um, the website. So the two different air cleaner models. Um, if there's any questions about the size of the air cleaner that you need, I've listed um, a short link here developed by Joe Allen and Shelley Miller. These are two um, indoor air quality scientists to help you size out the space um, needed for, for your fan. Uh, what I'll show you here next is just visuals because I love classic Victorian science to show that it works really well. Um, this is the exact same DIY design here. You're strapping a filter in front of the fan and you can see on the right here, this blackness, these are all the particles that have been produced on the air. So similar to particles, all the territory virus would also then get impacted um, onto that front of the filter and that's keeping it um, away from being inhaled and any risk of infection. They work really well in terms of lowering levels. So just visuals in terms of showing you how well um, they work within a space. This is just some measurements of particles that have been taken in the air with and without this DIY box fan being operated. The black line shows the levels that you see within a space. They are rising over time. As soon as you turn on that DIY box fan, those levels drop off very, very quickly. Um, and you can do this in repeated intervals and it will um, continue to work and have a high level of efficiency. Great, well, thank you, Crystal. I think we all we all need to remember that we, we learned a while ago and now we still need to be thinking thinking about this. Um, and especially as we get into the winter again, we're gonna, we're gonna all wanna make sure we're, we're going through this. Um, this the question uh, remains, uh, what is, um, what, what is the need for changing out these filters? Is it when we see them get black, like what you just showed us, we need to uh, get a new one in there or what's the, what's the magic? Is there a magic number? So th there's no magic number and it really depends on, on the type of space. Um, the one that I showed you before was being used in, um, in an area where there were wildfires. So again, those situations are great. You're gonna have some of those um, high levels of particles coming in and that's what the practice occurs. Uh, changing them out in a place where you just have singing musicians um, who probably last you for six months a year. Uh, in the case of maybe a pottery studio where you have other levels of dust being suspended, um, then in those cases, probably you'll see much more um, darkness, just like in that photo I showed 
um, and then changing those out as soon as you see that it becomes more um, brown or black. Great, thank you, so helpful. Uh, Judy, would you like to follow up with a couple questions? Yeah, so I, I have a question about choral rehearsals, situation where everybody in the group is vaccinated. Um, what is the distancing and spacing that would still be required with that kind of population working together? Is that a standard crystal question? I'm not sure. <laughs> Who wants it? <laughs> That's a crystal question. She's been working with the Yale School of Music on exactly these issues, so I'll defer to Okay, her. Crystal? I, right, so for the case of vaccinated individuals, um, Yale School of Music is, is going back to, to pre-COVID um, guidance in terms of, of distancing. That's assuming that all musicians um, and staff are, are fully vaccinated. Um, precautions are being taken if there are um, uh, individuals that are not vaccinated for, for particular reasons. And they're also looking into um, the amount of ventilation within those spaces. Thank you. Yeah. And then um, another question I have is, um, in what situations would we still be requiring masks? For instance, if we know that all the performers that are in a situation are under 12, should everyone be required to wear masks? So for the, the, the case where you have individuals that, that are not vaccinated, then masks and all of the infectious control measures that we have previously discussed and have been using um, would be applicable. Okay, yeah. It is frustrating when the rates are so low and the likelihood of infection is also low. Um, and um, there might be some exceptions made. For example, summer camp, outdoor activities, mm -hmm. uh, one might forego mask use because of the dilutional benefits of the, the wide open spaces and also the, um, the low background community incidence rates. Um, but then when the kids would come in uh, for their um, meals, you might want to try some some spacing since they're not wearing masks when they're eating. Mm -hmm. And then when they are um, in their uh, indoor social events, if you can do what Crystal has articulated and essentially have outdoor air indoors, then that might be uh, facilitative. But at the at the point where you have any doubt at all, you'd like to wear masks. And you may know that CDC has um liberalize their advisories about mask use outdoors so they're they're not recommending mask use outdoors thank you and we have judith uh from five point center for visual arts um i think we might have just touched on your question but uh is so. there anything you'd like to follow up with there no just basically um then should we if we know we're going to have a group of people young children under 12 come into the building at any point? Should all our staff be masked? Should everyone have a mask? Even though they're vaccinated? No reason to wear a mask if you're vaccinated. Okay. End of subject. But okay. <laughs> you've got the consumer confidence issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is psychology. That is not um, epidemiology. So I feel like if if there is a circumstance in which you're trying to put everyone at ease um, and you want to wear a mask to do that, uh, that's fine. But I do feel that um, the use of masks uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the full vaccination is essentially redundant. You, you, have, you, have, you have reduced your probability of acquiring a virus or transmitting it to such a trivially low level that mask use won't add much to that reduction in risk. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. What we'd really love to see, let's say that you run a dance studio and all of your um, students and all of your instructors and all of your other workers are vaccinated. Great. Now we're back to business. Now we just, uh, 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 function as normal. But if you have 60% who are vaccinated 
and uh, rates start to creep up next winter, now you're in a bind. And now we're practically back to where we started, except that we won't have as high risk because so many people are vaccinated. So we really would love to see, even in microcosms of your own customers and your own staff, if we can create microcosms of fully vaccinated groups, uh, we can really return to normal. That's great. Wonderful. Um, great, great. So uh, I'm going to move along here to uh, a great, a great question that um, that has come up. Uh, many of our organizations are thinking about fundraisers uh, and especially uh, and conventions this winter. So uh, we we obviously we don't know the answer to what you just suggested is that it, will there be an up uptick. Uh, do we do we know uh, know those things? But should we should we be um, requiring the hosting venues to staff staff to wear masks, or or is this really a consumer confidence question that I'm asking you, Stan? Uh, is it w when we're when we're going to bring 400 people into a convention center for uh, for an event? What's your what's your thought there? Uh, we don't know if those folks are, are vaccinated. That will hinge on our ability to achieve herd immunity. You do not have to vaccinate everybody in society to achieve herd immunity. So not everybody is vaccinated against diphtheria. It may be that 95% are, but there's probably 5% who are not vaccinated against diphtheria, but we don't have diphtheria because if it's introduced by a foreign traveler who's not vaccinated, then it doesn't have anybody to to transmit to <laughs> you know every the, the 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 vaccination rates are so astronomically high that there aren't any susceptible individuals so the there it doesn't create a trail of transmission and with measles we need even higher vaccine rates i mean we need 95 percent to achieve herd immunity because it's so infectious much more infectious than coronavirus uh, but we don't think we, we'll, we think we can achieve herd immunity with just 80% coverage. And um, that seems attainable in the state of Connecticut and perhaps the surrounding states. I worry about Texas, Oklahoma, Wyoming, places where there's more vaccine hesitancy. But, but I'm thinking that in the Northeast, we may do very, very well. And at the point where we don't have any COVID transmission, because we have herd immunity, then we can just go back to normal. That's great, it's fantastic. Um, Judith, uh, can I bring you back uh, with a couple of questions? Um, we want to we want to talk about um, consumer confidence just a little bit more. Uh, you want to share some of your questions there, Judith? Yeah, um, we certainly have signs on all our venues, both downtown and at the Arts Center, uh, explaining our mask protocol. We uh, post that on our website and through social media, newsletters. Is there anything else you can think of we can do to help make people feel comfortable again? Or is that basically, as you've said before, just get the information out to the community? I don't have any brilliant ideas. Um, uh, uh, there's a note from uh, uh, Liz Shapiro that she'd be happy to engage us with the uh, Department of Public Health and perhaps the state could uh, provide a little more specific guidance, you know, different scenario guidance, for example, where we might be able to say in this scenario, this would be acceptable. In this other scenario, this would be acceptable because I do think the the arts organizations are unique enough that uh, you know what 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 kind of audience can have two thousand people in the Palace Theater or you know or or three hundred people in a in a in a in a smaller venue or I mean you know mass events uh, require special consideration and uh, so I think we need to 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 see if not only our micro um, communications from our own units can be helpful, but also something where we can say we are following all state guidelines for the safety of the reopening of our museum, of our venue. And that's exactly what we've been doing. But now we need to see that guidance evolve uh, to match the 
more favorable um, uh, epidemiologic and environmental circumstances that we find ourselves in. But so it is Stan, critical Stan, to that's, rebuild um, confidence. Uh, uh, Judith, I know you have a couple more questions, but this is a perfect segue to something that I want to bring up real quick, and then we'll come back to you, Judith. Um, so many, you know, we talked today about um, about masks and how uh, how important they are in this process, but how we ho vaccines are, are key. We got to get people vaccinated. So many, I've, I've spent the last couple of weeks talking to venues about mask usage and what are their challenges. And, um, and I wanna, this is a part of what our survey, which we're gonna stick in the chat here in just a minute is about, um, is what are your needs? So for instance, one of the things that we're finding challenging in, um, in say some of the large theater venues that are using the venues today for hosting dance competitions with kids who are under 12, uh, you know, um, lots of families coming in as the families are showing up without masks. So they're, so they're going through a lot of masks in their venues, handing them out because they're, re, they're requiring it. Um, the, uh, the, some of the um, museums uh, have yet to open. Some of the smaller historical houses have yet to open with only just, I'll say private, uh, private um, uh, tours and, and smaller uh, things. So we're, we're trying to figure out how to help this community uh, continue to um, to have this, the resources that they need. So recently I've been talking to a philanthropist about would they consider helping us, uh, it seems like the natural step for this task force is to start providing things. And would they consider helping us with um, providing masks to Connecticut arts organizations for the next year? You know, would they, and, and what would that look like? Uh, currently, some institutions probably have masks that they, they were hoarding, and so they have a stockpile. And some may, uh, and they're not using them because most everything is out, outdoors. Um, and, and we've talked about um, the transference of uh, uh, using, using gloves early on, and now we don't, we don't really talk about that much. But we know, again, uh, as food gets reintroduced and all those kinds of things, we're going to have to talk about, about gloves again. So one of the, this wonderful philanthropist is, uh, is considering, would Connecticut need a million masks? Would we need two million masks? How many would we need? So I'm, I'm gonna stick this in the chat for you to all think about this. Is it, is it that, a, that a performing arts venue might need 60 or 80,000 masks that they per perceive in the winter going through January, February, March? Uh, is that something that, 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 that you all need? Is it a, a 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 that a museum might think they need? Or is this something you don't, you don't feel you need? One of, one of our other concerns, and, and Sten brought this up earlier, uh, that I, that I want to make sure that we don't forget is we don't want to get caught like we were without toilet paper. You know, we don't want to get caught in, in a situation where all of a sudden we need them. Uh, and so that's also another uh, part of this, this person's mission. So my goal here is, is to share with you, there's an opportunity, should we as the Connecticut arts uh, community uh, and, and beyond uh, uh, need that kind of um, PPE for the future? Can we foresee that if you think you do, uh, would you put down a couple of numbers? So that survey is going to come out here in just a just a minute uh, for you to kind of to fill in the blanks for us. And if we don't, I want to make sure that I tell that philanthropist, look, this is this is not a need. But I, I hear it's very difficult because we want our message to be get vaccinated, get vaccinated, get vaccinated. But also we know that there there are some other things. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. Sten, uh, any thoughts about that that generous that generous gift that, that we're we're trying to determine how to how to negotiate? You want to see it? I, right? I really, I really oh, hope. Right? I, I, I really hope we're getting oh, into the post-mask era. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm all for masks to reduce risk of a whole raft of respiratory viruses during uh, respiratory viral season. But I would really love to see people vaccinated. I mean, that is yeah. so, a so much better solution, more definitive solution to the bind that we're in, and. Um, you know, masks are not necessary for vaccinated people. So for every person you give a mask to who's vaccinated, it's kind of a waste of money. And for people who are not vaccinated, uh, we hope they'll bring their own mask and uh, they should bring their own mask and you can guide them to bring their own mask. And then you need a small supply uh, for people who forget. 
but I'm hoping that we won't need millions of dollars worth of masks. <laughs> you know, right. I, I'm hoping that your your donor, your benefactor, can perhaps help us uh, with our educational efforts, for example, uh, around um, uh, risk mitigation, around our ventilation. Um, rehab efforts. I mean, Crystal and I and you, Eric, have been to a number of venues which need some um, uh, ventilation overhauls. And a lot of small groups can't afford that. Right. And that right. would be a great thing to spend money on. And so I'm hoping that you can keep the the masks part of the donation to a minimum and put the money into something that would have a more definitive solution. But that's just my opinion. I'd be happy to hear other people's opinions. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. So, um, so I'm going to put this in the chat. We can all, uh, we can all, all go down that path. Um, this, this, uh, the, your other solution may be a different benefactor that we'll need to work on, but th this is, uh, this is great. Thank you so much for, for weighing in on that. Um, I, time is running short. Uh, Judith has a really important question to ask, I know, uh, and I want to share a little bit about legal, um, our, our legal uh, uh, future here. So, um, Judith, why don't you ask your quick quick question there, and then I'll um, I'll go into the uh, the legal portion. Okay, this is really it's really quick. All of us um, are, are working very hard on a lot of different levels to get our our um, venues open again. And it's really hard to keep up with federal and state guidelines. And I think this venue answered maybe a method for doing that and going through Liz Shapiro and the Office of the Arts. Uh, is there any other suggestion you might have on how we can keep up uh, with what's happening is, is at least as much as possible? Um, I was typing an answer to a question and then I was getting an incoming <laughs> phone call that I had to cancel. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I just lost the thread, and I apologize. I, I shouldn't be multitasking, but there are all these Q and A's, and I'm. <laughs> yeah, some no, this of them is, are really we're in the same boat again. Really, so what we're I, in think, the same I think, boat. Send you, send, I'll bail you out here. I think you did, okay. did really help us already. We need to continue to work with our our government and work together as a team to uh, to to work on some protocols. So uh, let me let me tell you what's going on uh, with with our legal questions. We, we again, Sten answered so perfectly or didn't answer so perfectly one of the questions that was asked earlier because we aren't lawyers and we're not, uh, we're not in that business to do that. However, we all need questions. So um, questions like, uh, can we legally ask audience members to sign a waiver releasing the kind of COVID you know, to our venue so they're not gonna come back and sue us? Can, can we legally require actors, orchestra productions have to be vaccinated? We, we've talked about these. Well, a really great question that came is, can we state that we've done our best if someone, especially a child, becomes ill? You know, is that enough? Or, or do we need um, a, a legal liability state? So what I've done is I've called a bunch of lawyers and basically they, they, most of them suggest that I refer you all directly to them for your specific problem. So I went to pro bono partners and said, let's discuss what can we do for everyone? So we've become a client of Pro Bono Partners. We are um, going to start with a legal, uh, with, a, with basically um, developing um, some templates so that you all can use them. Uh, perhaps a state, statement for your website, one that's really just uh, lawyer speak and, and others that are more general and, um, and consumer confidence type speak. So we're heading down that path of trying to help folks um, with the idea that, um, that, that really uh, we're, we're here to, to, we don't want everybody to go out there and spend their money in multiple on the same project, but we all do know it's unique. So do make sure that when you, um, when you re respond to the survey, ask, there's a section that says, what else do you need to know or something like that. Put in there what you need. Uh, like I said, we're going to start on this legal side by getting some general templates for you all to use. You'll need to vet them out with your board and, and with your, your senior staff and, and make sure that it's right for you. We're hoping that we can have a good space for you all to do that. Um, we're at the end. I don't know how this hour just flew by once again. Thank you, Stan and Crystal and all our fantastic team who's here today to help us with this. Um, please keep the emails coming. It'd be a lot help, more helpful if you guys could send us the questions ahead of the seminar. 
so that Sten and Crystal and I can look at them ahead of time and we can package them a little bit better for you. Yeah, that, we there's, the still there's still 11 unanswered questions yeah. here. And, uh, yeah, and my uh, email's just, not I've full. done the best I can here. And, <laughs> and some of them are very complicated. So is there a way that you can cut and paste them so that we have them for the... Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get them for the, for the next time around. Or, or oh, they're a bunch of chats too. Oh my goodness. Yeah, no, they're everywhere. So once again, folks, Please help us by um, by doing this uh, ahead of time. I just sent put the uh, the, uh, the 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 um, uh, survey in the in the uh, chat. So please take a look at that. S uh, send us your information. And again, help help advise, advise us when what, what we can do for you next. Uh, I'm wishing you all a great rest of the week. I guess the week is nearly half over. Um, and uh, enjoy seeing other people out in the community. Um, Anytime you need anything, don't forget, uh, you can reach out to any of our task force members or use office at shorelinearts.org uh, to, to get some answers, or at least we can get you in the funnel to get some answers. So anything, anything more, uh, Crystal or Sten, or any of my team that you'd like to, uh, to share before we sign off? All right. Signing off. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy the wonderful weather. Talk to you soon. Take care.